Okay. So for today, we'll introduce the zone um, flow or the zone, but we'll, we'll talk about nomenclature. And definitely in this picture, Michael Jordan is not in the zone. With that smile, he is not experiencing it. Here though, uh, as he's leaping from, you know, somewhere distant from the free throw line, uh, there could be guns going off in the crowd and he would have no idea. He is so focused on the task, so focused on the game, so focused on um, the goal that he has. If that ball needs to go into that hoop and it's almost there, there's nothing that could happen. An apocalypse could be taking place, right? And as long as, as, long as like stuff doesn't get zapped away in the rapture or something, he can't tell, right? That's the zone. That's the zone we'll be talking about. And it's not just sports. Sports is a great context to elicit it, but that kid may well be in it too, not during the photo op, but what that kid represents uh, may very well be in that zone space as well. And we'll talk about exactly what it means, how to achieve it, what the environmental triggers are, both external and internal, between this lecture and next lecture. Uh, we'll get through all of that. You know all of this stuff. I think the battery, these are brand new batteries. I, I don't know that they're working. Um, but just remember with the ACSM uh, criteria, that every single, when you have your next case study, begin with the ACSM criteria, the chapter two stuff about appraising risk factors and appraising the risk stratification, categorizing patients. And then uh, because it's going to be an older adult that you will uh, figure out uh, additional risk in terms of fall risk, functionality, stuff like that. So we will finish talking about this just from the review slide perspective of basic brain function, but we've done this one. We're going to move on to this one today. Um, now beyond those monoamine neurotransmitters, right? Beyond uh, dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin and stuff, we have uh, larger ones, neuropeptides. Peptides meaning a string of amino acids. It's not one amino acid, it's a string. And an important one of these, released from nerves, is orexin. And orexin does a lot of this sleep-wake state, right? So let's be alert when you're reading. Let's not fall asleep as, and, and forget what we read. Um, when you're driving, Let's be attentive on the road. When you're in a conversation after Thanksgiving dinner, let's be able to respond because you know what your uh, conversation partner said. Now, part of that Thanksgiving dinner, remember, when glucose goes up, eat a carb-heavy meal, uh, the mashed potatoes and, and jello and, and whatever else, um, the like can-shaped cranberry sauce, a bunch of glucose goes up. We're inhibiting orexin. Uh, leptin is released, right? As fat cells are growing, leptin gets released. That inhibits uh, orexin. Fasting, if you're like, okay, I'm not going to eat. I'm going to fast until Thanksgiving, really work up an appetite. And you tend to be more attentive when you're fasting. You tend to be, people respond differently to fasting, but you tend to be more alert and vigilant. Um, and part of that is the ghrelin response increasing uh, orexin. Um, BDNF and IGF-1, these have similar brain functions. So BDNF specifically, it's enhancing uh, the presynaptic neurons release of glutamate, excitatory neurotransmitter, um, the, the release of glutamate. It's enhancing the NMDA receptor uh, activity. It's helping to build uh, some of the roadways Right, it's helping to build some of that neural architecture. And it is also helping with myelination. BDNF signaling um, is helping with uh, myelination. And so uh, the, all of the dendrocytes are the myelinating cells here. BDNF signaling is enhancing that, that myelination, not exclusively, but it is part of the regulation uh, that is doing it. 
um, BDNF signaling, mTOR and MAPK. That's largely, that's not exclusively all it is doing, but largely BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is uh, PI3K, PKB signaling and getting some more of this translation of synaptic proteins. Remember, protein translation is what this is doing, and it depends what cell you're in. Are you in you know, the liver, the kidney, the brain, the muscle? What cell are you in? It depends what proteins you're going to be translating. Uh, when we were talking about genetics, and I said, you know, you're not growing hair out of the pancreas, right? You're spitting out insulin uh, and glucagon, depending on the cells, beta and alpha cells. Uh, you're, you're, not, you're not growing hair there. Uh, and so if you're in a nerve, it's nerve proteins uh, that you are, are growing. And again, mTOR signaling, that's really, BDNF does a lot of that. You do get some additional mTOR signaling through things like dopamine receptors, um, a little bit through some ionotropic receptors, co-activation of MAPK, right, ERK, RSK, MAPK signaling, a little bit of co-activation, but remember that PI3K, PKB, mTOR, that signaling cascade tends to be the most pronounced path, uh, the most heavily trafficked path. This is the I5 for protein translation in nerves too, not just skeletal muscle, but nerves too. Now, long-term potentiation and long-term depression um, depending on the timing, right? Late phase, long-term potentiation, we're creating new dendritic proteins where we are translating, synthesizing new proteins early. The early phase of, of potentiation, you're modifying the existing proteins. As you go farther and farther, um, sort of further and further into the, into the calendar, uh, and, and get, get longer and longer into adaptation, you're looking at new uh, protein synthesis being what, what that long-term potentiation is coming from. And this sort of dendritic sprouting, um, originally is, it was seen uh, in vitro, not in vivo, meaning in a body, but in vitro, and you just sprinkle some BDNF on it and it led to these to, to being likened to miracle grow with its effects on, on nerve growth. And you do see that in vivo too. It's just, you can't like just sprinkle it on. Um, IGF, think of it as BDNF part two. It does a lot. Now we talked about it from skeletal muscle and this primary regulator of skeletal muscle regrowth, regeneration, remodeling, hypertrophy, uh, mostly PI3K, PKB, a little bit of parallel MAPK uh, with IGF-1, uh, released in abundance from the liver, right? Hypothalamic pituitary liver axis. But its functions in the brain are really uh, important and pronounced too. Now, sometimes when you read uh, stuff like this, good study, um, but uh, when it says you know, you'll develop normally in the body with IGF, but it's your brain that, that doesn't you know, develop um, if you have deficient IGF. Don't take that to mean that IGF is not critical to uh, muscle protein metabolism, protein turnover and skeletal muscle. It is critical, but in some of these models, uh, you see normal mouse development in terms of the the physique, right, in terms of the frame, in terms of the body phenotype. But the brain in these IGF deficient uh, animals uh, does not develop uh, correctly, and you do see deficits. So IGF deficiencies correspond to cognitive deficits in development. Now, if you overexpress, if you overexpress IGF, uh, you do see increased brain development and you can weigh the thing. You can see it on a scale. You can see the brain development from insulin-like growth factor. Uh, and it also does, just like BDNF is doing the signaling um, for uh, the oligodendrocytes, right? So the myelin, um, let's, let's get some thicker myelin on here. IGF, just like BDNF, 
is contributing to those signals and uh, warding off apoptosis, right? Like cell death and prolonging the survival, uh, neuroplasticity in what is hopefully a good way, uh, neuroplasticity in the way that you would want to experience neuroplasticity. And then really what all of these things are doing, you're interpreting stresses, right? You're interpreting circumstances, situations, environments, stresses, loads. You're interpreting stimuli and you're trying to remodel your tissues so that they are best equipped to address those stimuli, those threats, those stresses, those loads. They are best equipped to deal with it. And it is specificity of adaptation. Um, so there's Edward Adolf over here. That was my favorite uh, specificity of adaptation guy. Uh, and Hans Selye, right? He was, he was general adaptation syndrome, which is why I have drawn, drawn uh, the, like an mTOR signaling, right? This is inhibition, right? And that's promotion. Um, this is Thomas DeLarmy over here. Uh, specificity of adaptation in a weak room. Um, so summary of IGF is it does all of these, these major neural functions, but we don't really assign it those roles because it's so, it's so important in the periphery that we tend to ignore the central nervous system effects of it. Uh, in muscle physiology, we look at its interactions with skeletal muscle and its regulatory functions with skeletal muscle, but it's critical to the brain as well. Uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, right? Vasculature needs to be uh, responsive to the stresses, responsive to decreases in oxygen availability. And in the presence of, of decreased oxygen, we should uh, create the network, create the map, the, the vascular map that will allow traffic to travel better, that will allow tissues to be more oxygenated. And so vasculogenesis, angiogenesis, those are downstream from vascular endothelial growth factor. And you know these signaling, yeah, that's focal adhesion kinase over there, but um, MAPK, PI3K, PKB, mTOR. Um, so you know the signaling cascades with these things, but it's critical in the brain too. It's not just peripheral vasculature, right? It's not like, well, I'm doing a bunch of cardio and my, you know, hammies need some more blood. Or it's not just that, it's brain too. Um, both neurogenesis and the expansion of vasculature in the brain. Um, fibroblast growth factor also, there are a lot of factors. This is a small handful of factors. Uh, so this is just a, a few of the factors. There are a ton of these things. And when we talk about exercise and how to elicit these factors, how to, how to make these factors work for us in abundance, um, there are strategies uh, with exercise the fibroblast growth factor too. So that's it for the basic brain function. We're okay with that stuff. All right, so let's get into the optimal performance state. Um, the nomenclature here, the names, I, I have yet to hear one that I like. I'm going to use the terms that are used. It takes a great deal of pomposity to invent your own term and say, mine's better. You know, omega, where you come up with some like term that sounds interesting with like Greek letters in it or something. Uh, so I'll use the terms, but like, oh, you're in the zone. I am in flow. Like this one is trying too hard. I think flow is trying a little bit too hard to be catchy. And this one isn't trying hard enough. And zone, what zone? You know, be a little bit more specific about the zone you're in. Uh, but whenever anybody talks about these states, it tends to be a sporting context and it comes out in a bunch of cliches or platitudes uh, and cliches. Like chock full of platitudes, which I, I have tried to figure, I love these cliches of figuring out where they came from. And nobody seems to know where this one came from other than like choke full, like oh, so my mouth is so full I'm just choking on it. Uh, but sports, sports, is the context, the environment, the setting, uh, 
in which flow or the zone, those mental and physical states seem to be most found most commonly or most easily elicited. Not that it's easy to elicit them, right? During sports, you training hard and working out of breath and, and, and there's this a great deal of, of direct adversity, not like sociopolitical adversity, but like there's somebody trying to hit you or something. What, you know, if it's football, if it's, um, uh, but there's a defense and they're, they're trying to stop whatever you're doing and trade sides and you're the defense of someone else. So there's this sort of direct physical adversity. It's not easy sports, but the environment lends itself to flow states. Now, part of what makes sports so uh, effective, and you can, you can pay attention to this little part uh, as it applies to what you do in life. If you don't do sports, some of you are athletes, but, but those who don't do sports, what about sports makes them so conducive to flow states? There is a direct goal, right? There's a purpose. The athlete has a purpose. There's a goal. You know what you need to do. There's a set of rules. You know how to behave. There's a challenge to be overcome. You're gonna confront a challenge and overcome it according to a set of rules. And there is immediate feedback. Did the ball go in the hoop? Or in the net or wherever the ball goes, in the hands of the you know, person you passed it to. Um, there's immediate feedback on all of these things. And at the end of it, you can reflect on what you did successfully, what did work, what didn't work. But in the moment, right, you have a purpose, a challenge, an immediate feedback that is connected to your own personal agency. It's not like stuff just happened. Gambling stuff sort of just happens. And even then you can find yourself in these states. But in sports, personal agency is a large part of it. Now, the guy who coined flow, he very less than a month ago, um, he died. But he, and he lived in California, um, sort of Hungarian. I think this, this is like a Transylvanian um, uh, name. But we're going to listen to his name out loud. Mihai Csikszent Mihály. Okay, so that's his name. Mihai Csikszent Mihály. Does anybody know the movie Zoolander? When I think it's Will Ferrell's character is is introducing, um, you know, it's like Katinka Shagovina, na na na. Never the line. And some of you know that's a little bit like his name. Um, but he is this. He's really. Um, Gregor Mendel, you know, he's like the father of genetics. Uh, okay, let's call him the father of flow. Uh, the nomenclature comes uh, from him, but um, he, he refers to this very, really um, intrinsically motivated people, internally, not externally, not extrinsic, internally, intrinsically motivated people. Um, they're curious and ambitious. They're in pursuit of an end. They're in pursuit of a goal as autotelic. That's, that's how he describes these people. We've been talking about telomeres, so let's do some, some root words, right? Greek, uh, telos, end. So uh, uh, telomere, right, the end part. Mere means part, sarcomere, flesh part of a muscle, right? Sarcomeres, longitudinal strings of sarcomeres, that, that's, your, that's your muscle. Um, so the flesh part, a telomere is the end part. Autotelic means it's self-driven, int uh, intrinsically motivated, self-driven, aimed at some end aimed at the, the, the telomere of, of accomplishments, at the end. Um, and so that is people in flow. There's a lot of intrinsic motivation. There are extrinsic components, extrinsic components, but people tend to be very intrinsically uh, motivated. Now, these are four of the books that I read. Uh, some of the contents in these slides um, come from, from these books. These three... Uh, they're a little bit older, 90, 96, 98, are from Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Those are his. 
Um, these three. He wrote more. Um, and those are the three that I read. And then uh, Rise of Superman, 2014. There's a little bit of additional commentary. Now, these three are it's a little bit more academic, um, but sometimes you get into the domain of science journalism, which isn't a science journal, right? It's not, it's not uh, you know, studies. And so, but some of the information, if, if you see some commentary that doesn't have a supporting citation behind it, uh, it either came from here or it's like an analogy that I made up. Um, so now characterizing the zone or, or, or flow, um, this little girl uh, is like daydreaming, right? This daydream doesn't go anywhere. But we think of a lot of things. We have a lot of thoughts during the day. And remember, we don't need to cling to all of them. We don't need to grab onto every thought. So this thought didn't go anywhere. We should grab on. So I don't think this little girl aspires in life. When you ask people, what do you want to do when you grow up? Um, most people don't say, I want to chain smoke at the casino. That's how I want to find a, a, a personal thriving mentality. That's how I want to find flow is cigarette after cigarette at the casino, at the slot machine. Most people don't um, have dreams about that. They don't aspire to be a, a slot puller. However, cigarettes, nicotine, cigarettes being the vehicle, nicotine um, does accomplish some of this chemical constitution of flow. Now, what we need, one of the components of, of arriving in this state is a very high concentration, but a low peripheral awareness. On that opening slide, you know, Michael Jordan dunking. Uh, if peripheral awareness, no idea. He has no idea if anyone can see him. He has no idea if, uh, I mean, he has some idea if the lights are on, you know, in the arena, because otherwise he wouldn't be able to see the basket. But he has no idea if, if you know, his teammates are there. He has no idea what his <clears throat> coach is yelling. He has no idea, um, you know, if you were to ask him, like, what kind of car do you have? He would have no idea in that moment. Uh, very high concentration on the immediate task. Low awareness of your, of your surroundings. So very narrow, and there's no distraction that can pull you out of that moment. I mean, if somebody physically, you know, like puts you in a stranglehold or something, like, okay, you're gonna be able to be withdrawn from the, from the environment. But there was this old video game, I don't know if it still exists in contemporary forms, but it's for Super Nintendo, an arcade called NBA Jam. And there was like, he's on fire! And then you, you make like every single shot. You just like full court, you just throw him. Or you dunk from like half court. <laughs> but you, you get like on fire. Now, whether, there's a totally different question of whether when you're in the zone, your shots actually go in the hoop. Totally different question. Um, and depending on how you do the analyses, depending on, on how you appraise this, uh, sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> you know, was Reggie Jackson, he was a famous baseball player in the 80s and you know, 70s and 80s. Was he genuinely Mr. October in the sense that statistically, was he much more likely to excel in the playoffs than he was in the regular season? Uh, depends how you do the analyses. Uh, I've seen analyses that say no. So this is actually a different question and one we're not really going to address, but um, this, this uh, attention to the, to the immediate task uh, and uh, performance that certainly doesn't suffer. Performance that doesn't suffer in, in a time when other people do suffer. Other people buckle under anxiety. Other people get in high pressure, tense situations and their performance suffers. The people who find themselves in the zone don't suffer. Now, whether their you know, three point percentage goes up, again, different, different story. But with, with nicotine, by some nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, um, opens up some calcium channels, and then you get the release of additional neurotransmitters, dopamine in particular. Dopamine is being released subsequently to uh, nicotine binding to its acetylcholine receptors. 
you get, and you get other neurotransmitters too. You get acetylcholine and serotonin and norepi and stuff, but dopamine, a little bit GABA, you know, GABA and glutamate, remember GABA is actually inhibitory, but dopamine, you're gonna get a bunch of additional dopamine and that dopamine effect can last longer in the presence of nicotine. That dopamine effect can last a little bit longer. Now this sort of classically dopaminergic reward system how do we feel satisfaction? We all know a little kid who says something and people laugh. And then that little kid says the same thing 15 more times, right? This reward system, how do we behave? It, it, it influences our behavior, how we are rewarded. If I give a lecture and I give the exact, I, I used to have, I haven't done this in a little while, but I used to have multiple uh, classes of uh, one, once upon a time exercise physiology, I haven't taught that in a while, um, and then muscle physiology, where I would do um, two different sections. I would give pretty much identical lectures in the two. And sometimes it would work in one class and it wouldn't work in another. I'd say the same stuff, I'd use the same analogies. And granted, if like in the first class, my analogy didn't work at all, I'd come up with a new one. but. Uh, on, on one audience, it might work really well. On another audience, it doesn't. The audience reaction is going to influence my reward system. It's going to change my behavior. It's going to change my perceptions of whether that was effective, whether that was good, whether it worked, whether I should do it again. So if I give a lecture and I look out and I see like sleeping people, I'm going to think the lecture sucked. If I look out and I see people like nodding, yes, you know, and taking notes, um, I'm going to think my lecture is pretty effective. In fact, at the end, I get a standing ovation. I'm like, oh, fine, I got to do that like every, I'm going to do that exact same thing. To, but I think it can be the exact same lecture in three different situations. And if that is my response, it's going to affect my behavior. The reward system is going to be very uh, different. My, my subsequent behavior will be different. Now, addiction to nicotine, you, we're going to augment this reward system. So what used to be sleeping faces now feels like nodding in the direction of yes, if there's enough nicotine on board and uh, consequent dopamine uh, being released. If my neurotransmitter constitution. Now, this effect of nicotine lasts a while. This lasts a while. This isn't like in and out smoke your cigarette and you better smoke another one within the hour otherwise this effect is going away there's a prolonged effect in nicotine that's different from cocaine um there's there's limited data on like heroin but this is that's very different um but there's some there's some published data on cocaine this is like you know here with cocaine you there's this rebound effect that is the inverse effect the opposite effect happens with cocaine. So, so the addiction is like, well, I used to get this nice positive effect and now it's worse than it was before I did cocaine. So where's another dose? Uh, with cigarettes, it's, or with nicotine, um, it's similar, but you, it lasts uh, much longer. Now, one of the effects of nicotine is what it does not just raise the altitude. It doesn't just say the baseline is now you know, a foot higher, where, where the reward system is just sort of unanimously higher, you feel good all the time. It's pulsatile. You get these higher peaks. Um, the reward is, is sort of explosive. Um, so here's, you know, the control group, the nicotine group has a more explosive, acute reward. So it feels really good acutely. But like, an hour later, you're not coasting on a slightly higher terrain. You know, you didn't just increase the altitude by a few feet of your emotions and, and your rewards. Uh, and so you get this pulsatile, uh, very acute augmenting of rewards. That's part of the zone or part of flow is getting this high concentration, low awareness. Uh, having this narrow focus, right? The people at the slot machines, maybe they're not as focused as Michael Jordan while he's in the air, 
or whatever the contemporary example is. Um, like who's like today's is like LeBron James is probably not even like the analogy people use today. He is okay. LeBron James, like LeBron James, who is his eyes are on the basket and he's charging it. There, I mean, a rhino could be running at him. The little horn just like charging it, and he he's still gonna get the ball in the hoop. He doesn't even notice like the stampeding of rhinos. He's not even gonna hear the lady chain smoking at the slot machine would hear a uh, rampaging rhino. She's not fully in the zone, but she has a comp she has components of it. She has part of this. Uh, so this narrow focus on the on the present demands. Nicotine certainly helps. Chemicals um, can can help get you there, but there's more to it. In getting into that that real. Um, I think everybody has experienced this doing something. The way I characterize it last lecture was the sun comes up and you had no idea. You thought it'd been 20 minutes and you started doing this activity at like 7 p.m. And like, oh shit, I, I, if I go to sleep right now, I'm going to get like an hour of sleep. So, but this exaggerated confidence comes with it as well. I mean, real inflated, exaggerated belief in one's own abilities, uh, personal agency, where I am in control of this situation and I will win. That sort of confidence. Um, there's no self-doubt. There's that, that internal monologue, oh, I don't know if this is the right move, or oh, should I die, oh, I need my block. You know, that conversation stops happening. Um, you are not fearful, you are not second guessing. You, you immediately make decisions you're sure that they're the right decisions and you stick with those decisions and you don't change your mind. That sort of confidence. Um, and then uh, an absence of um, sort of both fear and pain. And we'll talk about things like anandamide contributing to that on Friday, uh, but the negative sensations uh, do not plague you in that moment. And then the distorted sense of time. You sort of have no idea how much time is, has elapsed. Um, for that part, we'll talk about transient hypofrontality on Friday, next lecture. Uh, we'll talk about how these things uh, in particular work. But you can think of sort of the zone space in a, in a physiological perspective by the magical sense of Harry Potter, uh, liquid luck, Felix Felicis or whatever it is. Uh, if you're familiar with the Harry Potter movies, which I'm not quite sure why they didn't just all do that for the battle against Voldemort, why just all take it? And, and I think that battle would go better. Um, but uh, when when Harry takes it, and his confidence, he's like, "Oh, I'm supposed to be doing this thing, but I have a good feeling about going to Hagrid's," and he marches down to Hagrid's. Do you guys? Yeah, everyone knows Harry Potter. Um, and that sort of confidence in one's decisions. The decisions might seem weird, but you also you also keep personality. You don't become this, this hollow vessel of, of, kind of like mechanical decision making. You actually retain personality when you're in the zone, when you're in flow. And again, we'll talk about that stuff. So that is, is, a, is uh, an image of what the zone uh, would look like. Now, how, okay, let's watch Dan Osmond for a second. He's dead um, from something similar to this. He is not connected to anything. If he falls, he dies. He's just jumping. Jumps 
like misses a little bit, grabs somewhere else. Hey. And then he makes it to the top. Now, part of this exaggerated confidence, though, that sometimes maybe his decisions weren't fully ideal. He's almost, he's almost to the top. All right, there he goes. He's to the top. Now, sometimes when maybe his decisions weren't quite ideal, I think the way he died, and you can look this up, um, but he let he would get to the top and like you know tie the rope around himself and on a tree or rock or something and like jump and sort of like bungee jump or whatever. I think he did that and the rope broke. Um, and he just fell to his death. I'm pretty sure Dan Osman, you can, you can look him up. He was obviously a talented climber and was past tense. But that is a zone space, that environment where there is a task, there's a clear objective, there's a purpose, a goal, an objective. It's I, I'm standing here and then I must be standing there. And then to have agency, you get to decide where all these things are and then, and be able to have immediate rewards of whether this works and have risk. We'll talk about the amygdala and risk today. We'll get into that. Um, music is another situation in which people, uh, particular kinds of music more than others, in which people find themselves in the flow zone space. Um, so this is this is the group out. Um, there, that's Dave Brubeck. You know, this is like the Brubeck Institute used to be at, at Pacific. Brubeck Road or whatever, Lane Drive, something's right over there. Uh, but you get into jazz, and this is live performance. Blue Ronda, all in Turk, it's on his most famous album. Uh, and when people start riffing, when you have the head, this, the first part of the song, and then you, you play through the head and then you drop it and everybody plays their lead over top of what used to be the head as though it's still playing. One wrong note, you're gonna hear. One wrong note, one late note, you're gonna hear that. Um, the only saxophonist that I've ever truly enjoyed, um, not on this particular song, but we're not gonna watch the entire Brubeck song. Uh, other, it'll probably this. I'm sure when I upload this to YouTube, it'll have ads by. <laughs> the, this, the sounds um, are going to. It's going to be flagged as having some um, copyright infringement. But um, in music, you know, there's the attack is part of. Every time we talk about music, Kevin is never here. Um, he would he would provide good commentary uh, for this. So you know, additional perspective on music, but the attack that that first part of the note, somebody who's really in the zone, they don't ease into the note. Listen to a singer, listen to a singer uh, who is confident. They hit that note. That note just gets. There's no like. Let me see if I'm in key. I am. I'll get loud. There's none of that. Right. They just belt into the note. Now, if you're second guessing and you don't hit that note, you miss it. You a missed opportunity for a note. That's a silent space or you come in late um, or it's not as powerful because the attack is wimpy. You know? And so you have to be in the zone because if you make a wrong note, your song sucks and you play a wrong note to produce somehow a, a wrong note, uh, your song sucks. And the speed, the pacing, uh, the, the timing of it leaves you little opportunity for mistakes. You have to make correct decisions and you have to make them rapidly. Now here's, maybe this is a flow state. Yoko Ono, does everybody know who Yoko Ono is? Uh, John Lennon's living, you know, whatever, widow. Uh, so here's Yoko Ono. Per perfect time to like the high school class when you walk by. Oh, <laughs> 
Beethoven and Mozart and Tchaikovsky and Mahler and stuff. But like, what's the what's the best band, whatever? It'd be hard to say anything but the Beatles uh, and be taken seriously by a by a music critic. Um, however, everyone everyone blames Yoko Ono for like ruining. She's like the worst thing that ever happened to music. And sorry, from this perspective, okay, okay, she is. But then you ask people, what's your favorite John Lennon song? Everyone says Imagine. That's basically a Yoko Ono song. Without Yoko Ono, there's no way John Lennon would have, would have written something like that. We'd be doing like Strawberry Fields and whatever drug-addled, beautiful drug-addled music. Um, but uh, the zone, I don't think this is the zone. I think this is sort of a, a, a gimmick. This, they're finding themselves in the zone in that space. Now, I just, I just decided to put these words in Ron Weasley's mouth. Uh, you know, we have bad days. There's bad classes. There are bad exams. We, we cook badly. Um, we have bad night's sleep. We have bad dreams. We have bad acid trips. He casts bad spells sometimes or whatever. And that's fine. This is my friend Aaron Lum and I. Uh, we used to draw these little cartoons. So this is like, me, I've come to kill you, Bobby. <laughs> so this is like, this would be a bad dream. Uh, and we don't have bad flow states, though. This bad zone space. You know what? I was so indecisive. My self-esteem was really suffering. I was just doubting everything I was doing. Well, that's just not the zone. That's not the flow. This is the opposite, right? So we tend to have very confident, um, invincible-seeming flow states. So this is Pele. Um, Brazilian, famous Brazilian soccer player from his book. It was a strange calm. It was a type of euphoria. Uh, I felt I could run all day without tiring, that I could dribble through any of their team or all of them, that I could almost pass through them physically. I felt I could not be hurt. It was very strange. Uh, it was a very strange feeling and one I had not felt before. Perhaps it was merely confidence, but I felt confident many times without that strange feeling of invincibility. So he's characterizing that space that he achieves, that mental performance state that he achieves on the soccer field. Whatever the sport is, whatever the environment is, again, sport is a very conducive situation, circumstances for that. Um, but Murphy's Law, everybody knows, like, you know, uh, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Murphy's Law. Um, Colonel John Stapp, he's the one who's credited with, with saying that, that he didn't. I mean, that was, sure, he said it, but it, it was, you know, cliche by then. 33 years before he was born. It is found that anything that can go wrong, as he generally does go wrong sooner or later, whatever. Murphy's Law. He was really smart. He was an MD, PhD. Um, surgeon uh, who did most of his studying on uh, acceleration, deceleration on human bodies. He's a really smart guy, uh, but that's Murphy's Law. It's, I, I have a hard time crediting it to him when people said it before he was born. Uh, however, you can think of the zone or flow as the inverse of Murphy's Law, the IML, the inverse Murphy's Law, where whatever could go wrong won't. You're confident. Now, it's not that it necessarily won't go wrong according to the outcomes, but your confidence, there's no way you could see this going wrong. That ball is going in the hoop. This bat is, that ball is going over the fence or whatever's happening to a ball. Um, that's usually the outcome of something about a ball. Uh, but the, the confidence that whatever it is will succeed, your decisions are correct, and the attack of that note is 
as, as loud as you can go right uh, off, right out of the gates. Now it's facilitated by this environment. And we'll talk today about facilitated by, we'll do Friday caused by. So today, facilitated by internal and external environmental triggers. So both within and without. Um, we'll talk about those on Friday. Uh, increased concentrations of particular neurochemicals. This neurochemical cocktail, um, you know, dopamine and norabi and and on the timing of it, looking at like the afterglow afterward. You know, you have serotonin, you have anandamide. Um, the decreased uh, activation of particular brain regions. It's called hypofrontality. Hypofrontality, transient hypofrontality, meaning impermanent, brief, impermanent, goes away. Um, but the hypofrontality. Um, and then probably some brainwave stuff uh, as well, but facilitated by arousal. We all have different arousal states. Now, sometimes uh, you're sitting in class and I have fallen asleep in class before. I don't blame you. I have done it too, where you're, you're sitting there and your eyes, you just can't keep them open. And you're like, you're trying, like I'm trying to stay awake here, but this, you know, this you're one, two, three out of 10, out of 11, right? Let's, let's, um, the, Spinal tap, <laughs> uh, but you know, in this in this area right here, oh, it's hard to be alert at all. If it's a if it's a sport, if it's music, something like that, there's no way you're in the zone. Now up here, you're having a panic attack. Your hands are shaking. You can't think straight. You can't make a decision. It's just like if you're, it's it's not quite the fight of fight or flight. It's sort of fright, and you have no idea what to do when you're useless up here. Somewhere in this space is where you need an amount of arousal that really gets you excited, but doesn't compromise uh, performance. There are a couple different kinds of anxiety, right? Somatic anxiety. This is in your stomach, in your body, in your, in your, you can feel this, right? It's sort of like shaking in your heart, maybe you're sweaty and you have like the butterflies. I wish I knew who uh, Drew, though, so I can state a name. I'm sure, I'm sure you can like figure it out online and credit go to who, whatever. Uh, but, you know, so this is somatic anxiety, which is this bodily uh, effect. You can feel this bodily effect. Cognitive anxiety is exactly what you think it is. Cognitive uh, anxiety. And so distinguishing between cognitive and somatic domains um, if you look down here where the threat of electric shock, not like you're in the, in like an electric chair and you're gonna be executed, but, but like it's a, in a study, there's like some little electric shock. The threat of electric shock has been shown to have its primary influence on somatic anxiety. So there are particular stressors that elicit one or the other or both uh, by way of magnitude, how much somatic, how much uh, cognitive anxiety, as compared to um, performance evaluations and social uh, contexts. Uh, so maybe when, like if you're doing a presentation somewhere, you're giving a lecture or presentation, or um, you're a speaker, or you're taking an exam, something like that, it's likely to elicit more uh, cognitive uh, anxiety. And uh, the way we treat these, the way you want to cope with it, if you're a sports psychologist or you're a coach and you're trying to prepare your team for play, you have to treat these differently. There are different strategies to uh, temper somebody's somatic anxiety as compared to let me see if I can curb all that cognitive anxiety that you're experiencing. There are different strategies, different therapeutic approaches that will treat each one of these. So you can't just lump these in uh, to the same category and say, anxiety is anxiety. Anxiety presents itself in different ways and those different ways are addressed uh, by different mechanisms. 
Now, there's a lot of ways to assess it. You don't write down like back anxiety inventory, but that's a, that's a very heavily used one uh, in the literature. But talking about cognitive anxiety, just characteristics, let's describe this. Negative expectations. I don't think this is gonna go well. You know, if you go into, oh, this isn't gonna go well, this isn't gonna go well, I'm gonna fail. You know, this negative self-talk. Ah, I just don't see, I don't see me succeeding here. Ah, this is, you know, this is gonna be horrible. And that, right, these worries and concerns about your performance, potentially safety, consequences of some sort. Oh, this is gonna end badly. That is your cognitive uh, anxiety. As compared to somatic anxiety, the perception of, of physiological arousal. Right, the perception of um, you can you can feel your nerves, right? You can feel uh, the manifestation of of your nerves. And another another way of describing this, right? Just more description, or more words of this. The somatic numbness sometimes for people. You know, they're just, they're tingly or numb or like they're cold or whatever. Maybe you have to pee. You're really nervous and you just have to pee so badly. I just went like three minutes ago. Yeah, but it feels like your bladder's full. Try to pee, nothing's gonna come out. You know, so these, these types of symptoms, an unsteadiness, I feel a hot feeling, you know, maybe you're sweating. And the cognitive, fearing the worst. You're fearing the outcomes. You're not seeing this as a, as a challenge for which you're going to triumph. A, a, a opportunity to display your training. That's not how you're seeing it. You're terrified or fear of losing control, a fear of loss. That's the cognitive uh, part. Now in older populations, let's get out of athletes. Let's look at healthy older populations. No cognitive decline, but look at, uh, I'm using a lot of fantasy literature references, uh, Radagast the Brown, right? He was the um, adult wizard. Who's the, okay, you guys know Lord of the Rings, the five wizards. There's the brown, the two blues, the white, and the gray. Um, and he was the one who was just sort of quirky and can't remember stuff. Uh, so if you're, you're full of anxiety um, in, in older populations, you do see some poor cognitive performance. Historically in the literature, uh, anxiety associates with poor cognitive performance. But this study was looking at specific domains of anxiety, because um, anxiety isn't just anxiety by itself. So a cognitive performance example, older adults without dementia, um, greater levels of somatic, but not cognitive anxiety, were related to poor performance on select measures of attention and executive functions that require speed of processing and fine motor skills. So anxiety, depending on the brand, the, the qualities of anxiety will manifest differently in performance. But let's get into athletes, human performance. People care a great deal about this, right? In 2003, there's already, this is about 20 years ago, there's multiple meta-analyses coming out. Meta-analyses already coming out 20 years ago on um, cognitive anxiety and these different types of anxiety and sport performance. How do we perform? And so this one right here, um, 48 studies that they lumped together. Remember a meta-analysis is after all these analyses have been done, let's pull them all together and reanalyze after analysis, meta-analysis will reanalyze after the fact. Um, and so then what they found, you know, cognitive anxiety and performance, um, self-confidence and performance, but relationships with both. So anxiety and performance worsening it. People who are experiencing anxiety, people who are experiencing confidence were improving. And that one was a little bit stronger. The self-confidence effect was a stronger R and a lower P. It was a more confident, statistical confidence, like Ronald Fisher confidence um, associated with personal confidence um, than was the uh, caught in one. But males in this study, in this meta-analysis, males were uh, disproportionately affected. Males had stronger associations than females, uh, enhanced by confidence and uh, not ruined, but, but um, their performance was worsened by 
uh, anxiety. Males had a slightly exaggerated response. Now, 2017, right? The literature continues and continues and continues. And what we know in sports psychology, huge domain, we know that anxiety is potentially problematic. Anxiety potentially ruins a performance. And there are a range of strategies to offset it, a range of strategies to settle that anxiety, settle those nerves, allow us to perform uh, better. But again, anxiety presents itself in a number of different ways. It depends on the person. Everyone in this room might have a different expression of anxiety. One person might shiver, another person might sweat. Right? One person might start talking really fast, another person might become um, an extrovert. You know, one person might be too nervous, another person might just like burst into the fray, whatever it is, or just scared and nervous, and that's how they address it. So anxiety presents itself depending on the person, depending on the history, depending on the context, depending on um, the setting, the environmental setting. Anxiety presents itself in a number of different ways, but if unaddressed, if we just allow anxiety to um, fester, to be a squatter in somebody's body, and we don't address it, then potentially performance suffers, but also risk of injury, rate of healing. You know, when are you gonna get back on the field? When are you gonna to return to play? Risk of re-injury, all of these things have found associations in the literature with anxiety. So it's not just, did the ball go in the hoop? It's also, am I gonna be sitting on the sidelines this season? Am I on the DL this season? How long am I on the DL? Am I gonna be on the DL next season? Those questions also have relationships with anxiety. So it becomes important to understand how anxiety elicits its actions. And historically, there are a lot of theories. They, what I love about physiology, biochemistry, things like this, is there are answers. You can run an experiment and measure it. You can test phosphorylation states. You can measure how many grams of something. You can test the pH. There are measurable, objective outcomes. When it gets into psychology, uh, A, I'm not a psychologist, and B, there's a lot of subjectivity that, that starts to creep in. And so it, it permits room. You can't close that door and say, no, -uh, the pH was this, and close the door, right? It leaves the door open enough for theory after theory to sort of sneak their way into the room. We'll talk about a few of them. Um, reversal theory, drive theory, and inverted U. I like the inverted U. It seems to describe me best. It doesn't necessarily describe everyone best, but this is the inverted U. It is not new. 1908, right? This isn't new, but it says this. Here's performance. As you go up, that means you're performing better, whatever it is. You're better at basketball. You're better at baseball. You're better at swimming. You're better at guitar. You're better at music. You are like Yoko Ono good at music. <laughs> Um, arousal, the more nervous, jittery, aroused you are. Remember that that's um, one to 10, whatever, one to 11, the Nigel Tufnell scale, uh, one to 11. Uh, the more arousal, you're gonna get better and better and better and better performance, right? You can't just be half asleep and take the plate and expect to hit the ball. The, the pitch is coming at you like 95 miles an hour and like you're nodding off. You're not gonna hit the ball, right? You need a certain amount of arousal, too much arousal though, and you're like shaking and you're panicking and your thinking isn't there. Um, and so too much arousal starts to ruin your performance. So this is the inverted U theory. And it, it's, not, it's not the same for every context and every person. So ability, somebody's ability and history of practice matter. Somebody who is really trained and conditioned and has an extensive history of competing in that situation can handle more. The arousal, A, the performance is gonna be way higher because they're just better, right? Here's the performance of a beginner. Here's the performance of an advanced person. The performance itself is better, but also you can shift this to the right where more arousal is required 
to, to elicit a, a larger and larger effect. Um, and so somebody who's, who's very talented is going to have A, a higher curve, B, shifted right. They can deal with more arousal. More arousal is an ergogenic aid to them. Personality seems to matter. Different people require different amounts of arousal. For some people, you say, all right, get off the bench and, and you know, take the place of um, Callahan or whatever. The university's president is now uh, on the field. Um, and, you know, get, like, all right, Randall, you're out of here. Go, kick, like, Cal, Cal, you get in on the field. Tell me, like oh my God, I've never on the field before. That person is like terrified. And all they're doing is taking the field. Um, and so like introverted versus extroverted. This is just one way of, of characterizing personality. Different personalities are going to influence how much arousal is necessary. It's not just training, personality matters too. And then the, the, the skill or sport or task itself is also important. A really simple skill, you have tons of arousal is fine. If you're just sprinting, run for your life. Bang, bang goes the gun and you can run. That's a lot of arousal. Bang, bang goes the bazooka, right? And you're not like, oh, I forgot how to run. Uh, I'm too, I have too much you know, nervous activity. I have no idea how to run. You are gonna know how to flee and you're gonna do it well. Um, and so if there's a very simple skill, run, jump, whatever, you can handle a lot of arousal. But if it's like, go play guitar, go play an instrument. Again, I wish Kevin were here. Play your instrument. And you thought you were going to be practicing in your bedroom? No, you're at Carnegie Hall. Go, oh, shut Right? Your fingers don't work anymore. That's too much arousal. Too much arousal. And you're going to, you're going to miss notes. You're going to play. You're like, oh, I can barely even, like, I didn't even remember the chords. Um, and so complex skills versus simple skills, personality traits, history of training, all of that matters. Now, the, the drive theory I don't like. This doesn't describe me at all. This is like the worst description of it, where it's a linear relationship, where it's just the more arousal on the better performance. This is from 1943, and I thought the 1908 folks got it better. Um, now there's a catastrophe model, we won't talk about that, but like, yeah, we're doing better, 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 oh, doom. Okay. Um, but the, the drive theory is that we are driven by anxiety and, and we're gonna perform better and better. Fine. Uh, 1982, fast forward the world a little bit, um, the reversal theory. This one is good. Uh, it starts to get more complicated. What I like about the inverted U is it's simple. Is there room for complexity that a, that a sports psychologist can, can make sense of and decipher and uh, employ? Yes, there's, there's room to, to build upon the inverted U. But just think with the reversal theory, think about our own attitudes, adding your attitude, adding your perceptions. Now back to lecture 25, um, I think this is actually from lecture 26, talking about lecture 25, but uh, where I said, do you see the upcoming event as a challenge or do you dread it? Are you excited for the challenge to debut all of that work that practice and the exercise you've been putting in to put it to the test and debut your skills and sort of, is it, is it an exhibition? Uh, in that case, good for your telomeres and uh, good for managing arousal, managing nerves. Are you dreading the upcoming event? Sort of fear, what is your mindset? How do you perceive the, uh, the jitters? You're supposed to get the jitters. If you don't get the jitters, you have a problem. Uh, people who, you know, their event is coming up. Now, I have spent a lot of time in, in fencing tournaments, even though I don't fence. Um, I just know people who do. And you can usually tell who's going to win and who's going to lose, not by where they came out of the pools, right? Well, what was their rank coming out of the pools? But what they do between bouts, somebody who's sitting there or like walking around eating a hamburger or something, they are not nervous. Their arousal is so low, they're going to be defeated by the beginner. Like, yeah, you were in the Olympics 20 years ago, but this 14 year old is gonna waste you because he hasn't eaten in like nine hours because he's like terrified. 
well, that's too much arousal. You get what I'm saying. Um, there's people who are like eating right before the event. Like, how do you have so low arousal that you're putting food in your mouth? Uh, my appetite goes, you know, I, there's no amount of urine that could leave my bladder. I mean, my bladder could be dry as like, you know, the, like Saudi Arabian sands. And, and still like I have to pee. There's, there's an amount of, of nervousness um, but your focus on it, that matters. Um, so the, you know, again, facilitated by danger, danger, intensity, um, this matters. Our perceptions matter. We are constantly processing information, endlessly, constantly processing information. We assign intensity to that information. We assign importance or intensity to that we have two amygdala, um, two amygdalas, um, but this uh, is where we are assigning, part in part, where we are assigning, like the Homeland Security Advisory System. We're red, we're orange, we're yellow, we're blue, we're green. What is our risk? This is like post 9-11 stuff. It was always like, we're orange all the time. Um, and the, the assigning of, of attention and, and, and kind of dread and concern. The amygdala, which is right here. And again, you have two of them. So there's another one over there. Um, the amygdala is receiving information and interpreting it. Um, receives a variety of sensory information from the surroundings and assigns appropriate amounts of emotional intensity. Um, and then it participates in all sorts of regulation. It just goes everywhere. The amygdala goes everywhere. You don't need to write down that stuff, but the hypothalamus, it reaches out to the hypothalamus. The amygdala reaches all over the place to inform your body how to respond, to inform you how to respond. So as risk increases, as the intensity of that moment increases, the situation becomes more risky epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine we're going to release. Um, now, risky success feels really good. I mean, that's like the speeding cars. Why do people speed all the time? Do like dangerous driving and stuff? It's, it's risk reward. It's actually to, most likely is a result of a brain that isn't fully developed yet. And the risk reward system hasn't fully established itself. However, all of these people are wondering, and even the trees are wondering why everybody puts off their assignments and puts off their studying until like the day before the event. You need a neurochemical constitution to put you in that alert, risky, dangerous space where you can focus, where you can get somewhere near the zone. If you behaved I'm not saying you're capable of behaving in this way um, because you would need rest. But the day before an exam, you study and study and study. I mean, you put in like eight hours. I'm not saying everyone in the room, but, but don't study, don't study, don't study, don't study, don't study. Oh shit, the exam's tomorrow. Study, 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 study. Or write that term paper for the whole day or something. Imagine if you behaved that way all the time, how much you would accomplish in life. You'd be like eight people if you can make use of all those hours, but finding yourself in flow or the zone, we wait until there's danger. We wait until the amygdala says it's getting intense. We better focus. And then you're able to, to have this narrow focus and make enormous leaps uh, in progress. But some of the external triggers of a rich environment, which means a lack of predictability, Think slot machines, you, you don't know what's gonna come next. A lack of predictability, novelty. There's stuff you're unaware of. You haven't seen this, you haven't smelled that, you haven't seen that, you haven't heard that sound before. There's novelty, you're gonna pay attention to novelty. You can tell if somebody is, um, when I was in Hong Kong, I spent the whole time going to the buildings, right? That's what I did. Now you can tell who, is not a tourist because they go, you're in Hong Kong and you're looking at your shoes. 
but they've seen all of that a thousand times. It's boring to them. Novelty puts us in that zone space. Uh, and, but it, again, it could be a sense, it could be a sound. Well, that's a weird sound I haven't heard before. It turns out it's just a squirrel in mating season or something, but it's a weird sound and you focus, right? And some complexity, not the same complexity, but some of it, a wandering mind. I mean, this, imagine if there's predators, like if this is how you play basketball, like with that, you're not gonna find yourself in the zone. You need a, a lack of predictability, some personal agency, um, tons of novelty and, and some complexity. Um, and again, unpredictability, that's part of why people keep doing this is this dopamine surge. I'm trying to figure out how to solve that, that riddle. Um, the internal triggers, attention. This is controllable. Now, most people love the feeling of paying keen attention to something, love that feeling, but there's a, there is a laziness that keeps us from doing it. It is not comfortable to have that fierce stare, that, that, that fierce attention. It's, it's not cozy or comfortable. It takes a little work to get there. And so people tend to eliminate this uh, attention from their lives. And in so doing, eliminate their experience of the zone. And that's where drugs come in, whether it's nicotine or you know, cocaine or, or you know, excesses of um, you know, caffeine or whatever it is, um, to try to get those neurochemicals calibrated in such a way that the environment could do or attention could do. So there are sensory inputs all over the place. If you pay the best attention you can and you're in an environment that is conducive, a novel, unpredictable, slightly complex environment, your attention is going to, the sun is gonna come up and you're gonna to have to find yourself forced uh, to go to bed. But you know, there are different contexts in sports, uh, extreme versus mainstream sports, team versus individual sports. This will arise differently and it will manifest differently. It will rear its piper focused head differently depending on the context. So that's what facilitates it, what it's caused by getting into um, what the brain does. This will be next lecture. Um, you know, the neurochemical cocktail that's going to, that's going to cause it. The hypofrontality, transient hypofrontality, and um, the, a little bit of chat about some of the brain waves um, that are associated with the performance. All right, that is it. So, oh, was that the standing ovation that I was talking about? <laughs> uh, so Friday, we'll finish those three things. Monday is the case study. The following Monday and Wednesday is exercise, behaviors, nootropic supplements, stuff like that. And then the final day is April's uh, clinical neuro PT. Um, what day is the day of the actual final exam? You know? I had off of the top or the bottom or the middle of my head. I I don't know. It's, it'll be just pull up the syllabus and scroll the bottom. Okay. Um, right. It'll be in there somewhere, the actual day of it.